This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you. Good morning, everybody. You guys doing well? Yes, welcome in, welcome in. Those of you guys who are joining us online, we love you guys. We welcome you here with us. Um, we've been here in the building for a little while. We said we, we start at 930. I just want everybody to know that when we're here at 930, we, we are praying. That is the most important um, aspect of this relationship with God through Christ Jesus is the ability to come into his presence and pray. And so we've, uh, we've been doing that in the building. And um, yeah, that's, it's a lot of fun. So if you're local, uh, we encourage you to get here. Um, but yeah, we, we do have a really good morning. We're just thankful you guys online are, are, are checked in with us right now. Um, Reverend Bob Carden's teaching the word. And so we're, we're excited for that. You know, things are a little bit different <clears throat> now that uh, Jess... Mendoza, who is our worship director, she is very close to um, having their, their fourth child. So we will be going without music, live music, uh, here. So things are going to be a little bit different. You know, music is so good to obviously worship God, but there's so many other ways to worship God. And so I'm really excited for the next couple months as we exercise you know, perhaps some muscles of worship that uh, we're not used to, uh, not used to exercising. And that's only just going to build us up. So um, I'm really, really excited for that, and I'm expecting a lot in that regard, too. Um, some other housekeeping things. I want to introduce you guys to something that you're going to be hearing uh, frequently. It's called Midweek Momentum. It's something that we are introducing in an effort to bring more content uh, to you guys. So obviously, you know, we, we, we stream live every Sunday at 1030, but we want to get out more teachings. We want to get out more content to you. And so that's going to happen on Wednesdays. We've been doing it with, you know, a, a lot of music that we've, we've been posting and stuff like that. But we're, again, we're going to start to, to post some teaching. So this Wednesday, um, Reverend John Drake um, has got an amazing message that I, I highly encourage you to check out. We actually recorded it uh, the other week, and I had the privilege of being here, and I got to hear it firsthand. And he shared some things that he's not shared with anybody. So it, it, it's fantastic. It's real. It's raw. It's, uh, it's, it's perfect. So I encourage you guys to check that out. We're going to drop that on Wednesday. So it's called, again, Midweek Momentum. So keep an eye out for that stuff. Uh, this morning, I, before we begin, I just want to read something. It's in uh, Psalm 31. As I was running today, I, uh, I was listening to, to Psalms, and, uh, and this verse just blessed me, so I thought I'd share it with you all. It's uh, Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. How abundant is God's goodness that he has stored up for those that fear him or have uh, reverence for him, and that he's taken that goodness and he's worked it for us. He's worked it for us. It's pretty awesome, huh? How abundant is God's goodness? So we bask in that. We just give praise, glory, and honor to God. So again, I love you guys, and it's just a, it's a blessing to be able to, to hang with you this morning. Um, what I want to do is I want to introduce Pastor Bob Carden to come on up, and he wants to uh, share a few things as he leads us into this new season of worship. Yeah. Be on. Yeah, I'm good. I'm out. You're out. I'm in. Okay. So out, out with the new, in with the old. Is that what that is? <laughs> but uh, as, uh, as Garrett said, you, you can tell that I'm not Jessica. And just so that you understand, Jessica is not our music pastor. Jessica is our worship pastor. 
which means that it is her responsibility to help us, to help lead us in corporate worship. And she asked if I would introduce this new time of worship that we're going to be doing starting this morning, going for the next several weeks. But before I can talk about worship, I want to talk with you about relationships. Because when you became a Christian, you got a new relationship. You were made a son or a daughter of God, and then you had a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. But that's not the only relationship that you had. When you became a son or a daughter of God, you were also placed in a family. So if you think, I think of my family growing up, we had, I had a personal relationship with my father, but I was also in the Cardin family. And both of these relationships, as a child of God and within the family of God, they're important and they're necessary. That's why being a Christian isn't just about sitting home and praying and reading your Bible. It's about being together. And there are things that we do in our quiet and private time with God. There are things that we do when we get together as a family, as a church. And then there are things that we do in both places. And worship is one of those. We are encouraged to praise God, to worship God privately. We are also encouraged to praise and to worship God as a family. But how do we do that? How do we worship God? That's, you know, worship is one of those words that's around. What does it really mean? Well, I want you to consider that as a Christian, you are a three-part being. You are body, you are soul, and you are spirit. So if that's everything that you are, if you're going to worship God with everything that you are, well, then there are three parts of you. You can worship God by the spirit. You can worship God with your soul. You can worship God with your body. Now, when it comes to worshiping God by the Spirit, if you're going to worship by the Spirit, then you have to be utilizing the Spirit that God has given you. And this is primarily done in your private devotions with God. The most common way to worship God by the Spirit is through something the Bible calls speaking in tongues, where you speak a language that you have not learned by the five senses as the Spirit gives you the utterance. And that is speaking to God, it says in Scripture. But that's not what we do when we get together. Now, when you can speak in tongues in your private life, you can actually be sitting here now speaking in tongues silently. But when we get together as a church, when we get together with others, then we are worshiping with our body and soul. And when it comes to worshiping with your body and soul, it's not just music. Music is simply the most common way people engage their bodies and their souls in praise to God. But it's not the only way. Music and singing by themselves are not worship. They are a vehicle of worship. And it's not the only way to engage your body and your soul. And over the next several weeks, we are going to be exploring various ways that we can praise and worship our wonderful God with our bodies and souls. And first to lead us in that this morning will be Reverend Steve Carter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's pretty, pretty lame, guys. Can we? Okay. So I am honored to do this, and I want to I start with a verse that was read earlier this morning when we gathered together for just some fellowship time. Um, and this was read from Psalm 9, verse 1 by Carolyn. Lord, I will worship you with extended hands as my whole heart explodes with praise. I will tell everyone everywhere about your wonderful works and how your marvelous miracles exceed expectations. That's what we want. We want God to exceed our expectations. And to be honest with you, our expectations are often so low, it's not hard for him to do that. But if we raise him really high together, he's still going to exceed that. And as Bob said, you know, worship is not just in song and it's not just with our bodies. It can be with our souls. And this morning, I'm asking you to really work with me here. Maybe lean a little forward, engage yourselves a little bit. And you at home, you know, lower the bark a lounger to where you're in an upright position or whatever. <clears throat> and I want you to think with me. So, you know, our heart is our, that immaterial reality in a human being. It's our heart. We want to engage that, but we, we also have to engage our brain, which is part of our body. 
our neurons. And I want you to think about something with me. And it's really important for us to understand God as creator. Nothing can happen without there first being creation. I mean, I, that sounds like, well, duh. But do we really think about that? Do we wake every day realizing that we don't live in just, we, it didn't just start that all this was here, that that was the starting place, that it actually started with a creator. And when God created, it says in verse one, what did he create? The heavens and the earth. So now I'm gonna share something with you and I want you to travel with me, okay? Think about what I'm saying, because this is not normal stuff that you're gonna hear you know, in mass media every day. However, everything I'm going to share with you is scientifically known. It is absolutely known. It is better known this moment than it was when I was a kid. This, I'm going to describe for you things that every scientist who studies the universe knows. Okay? So if it helps to close your eyes, whatever. But I want you to think about this. In the beginning, God created. Now, what does that mean? That means things didn't come from nothing. The universe and everything about it didn't come from nothing. It came from whom? God. And one of the aspects of God, one of his attributes, his characteristics, is he's light. Light is electromagnetic energy. It is, it is a, it's something. It's a material thing in the sense that it is an energy. It's a wave. It's a particle. We don't even know exactly how to characterize it. It's so incredible, this thing called light, that to this day, nobody knows exactly how to explain it. But it is the thing that God spoke into being, and in the beginning, he spoke into being light. People call it the Big Bang, but it wasn't like an explosion. It was like there was nothing, and then there was light. And let me tell you about this light, this energy. For you scientists out there, you know this. What happens to energy when, it's, when it starts to, when it coalesces? It turns into matter, things. That's what happened. He started with light, but some of that light coalesced into stars and planets and things. But it all is made up of light. What happened after that? After the planets and the stars? And guess what? This is really cool. Great song by Joni Mitchell. We are stardust. You know what we are? Because stars exploded over time and created the, the elements that we're made of. But where do those elements trace themselves back? When God said, let there be light, if you, you also know you can't destroy energy. The universe has laws. You can't destroy it. That means every bit of energy that exists today, right now in this room, existed when he said, let there be light. In fact, that's where it all stems from. And so material things came from that light. Your bodies are made of elements that came from light. Every cell, you got 56 trillion, maybe 60 trillion in your body. 60 trillion cells are made up of molecules that are made up of atoms that come from when he said, let there be light. Your everything in our lives is traceable back to God, the creator. Think about that. We are the created thing, and that's not some metaphor. It is literally true. Nothing would exist if it wasn't for God. So we worship him, right? We worship him as creator. If we lose, if we lose sight of him as creator, first and foremost, we, we will slowly erode into forgetting that we are the created thing. Well, we're not. And so I want to read to you another psalm, as soon as I can get to it. And then I'm going to give you an assignment. You have pens and paper. That's, there's a reason for it. There's some work to be done here. OK. But I want you to listen to Psalm 8, because this is where we really come in. This is how God describes us. Lord, this is from the Passion Translation, okay? So, Lord, your name is so great and powerful. People everywhere see your splendor. Your glorious majesty streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. You have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Think about that. 
babies sing a song back to the creator of praise. You know, I'm sitting up here because Jessica Mendoza is about to have a baby. And when God thinks of babies, he thinks of their crying as a majestic song of praise back to him because he knows where they came from. He knows that he designed life in such a way that every human being is produced and becomes a baby. And when they sit, when they draw breath and they cry, he's like, nothing sweeter to me. It says, strength rises up with a chorus of singing children. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. Look at the splendor of your skies, your creative genius glowing in the heavens. When I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings, I know you are the fascinating artist who fashioned it all. But when I look up and see such wonder and workmanship above, I have to ask you this question. Compared to all this cosmic glory, why would you bother with puny mortal man or be infatuated with Adam's sons? Yet what honor you have given to all of us, to men and women, created only a little lower than Elohim. That's the name God in Genesis 1.1. Crowned like kings and queens with glory and magnificent, you have dele delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. All the created order and every living thing of the earth, sky, and sea, the wildest beasts and all the sea creatures, everything is in submission to Adam's sons. Lord, your name is so great and powerful. People everywhere see your majesty. What glory streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. Think about that. I mean, think about this. The creator, so magnificent. So, I mean, there's no words to describe him. His ways are so beyond ours. His thoughts so beyond, beyond ours. This magnificent God and creator said, here's my gem. Here's what it's all about. I want to make human beings who will bear my image and have dominion over my good, good creation. And as those who have that rulership, we are also called priests, and priests stand at the altar and they bring praises back to the Creator. So we take the sum of all our praises and the sum of all the praises of creation and we bring them back to God. And that is one way we can worship our wonderful Heavenly Father. So what I would like you to do, and this is just a moment for you to have, and I really encourage you to lean into this. Take the pen, take the card, I want you to write just a, a verse of praise to your Father, to your God. Just write something that comes from your heart as to how you see him, particularly as the one who created all things, including us. And when you're done with it, just read it to yourself in your mind slowly.
Lord, I will worship you with extended hands. As my whole heart explodes with praise, I will tell everyone, everywhere, about your wonderful works and how your marvelous miracles exceed expectations. I'd like to pray with you. Father, we are so blessed and thankful to gather together in this room and around the stream, whoever's streaming, that people are gathered together in your name and we are lifting up our hearts to you and exploding with praise when we think of how marvelous are your works and how marvelous is your heart of love behind that. Continue to reveal to our hearts, Father, the majesty of you as creator and bring us closer and closer into that relationship with you so that we, with the spirit of Christ in our hearts, can cry, Abba, Father. Thank you, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you all for worshiping together this morning. Reverend Bob Carden will now come up and share the word with us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was wonderful. I'm going to read you what I wrote. Thank you, Father, for giving me a voice to praise you and to share your goodness with others. And I'm sure everybody has something that God put within their souls to write down at that time. And uh, so this morning, I want to share with you a little bit about God and his goodness and his love and his ways. And I titled the teaching, By Faith or By Me. And Garrett shared on a couple of occasions, starting in the first Sunday of January, when we began meeting back here again, that God had put on his heart that moving into 2021 our theme would be by faith. So I want to talk a little bit about what it would mean, what it would look like to live by faith. And I also want to show you what it doesn't look like. And my title sort of gives both sides. We have by faith, we're going to see what that means. The opposite of living by faith would be living by me, would be living by Bob in my case. To learn to live by faith, because living by me, living by Bob, is just the natural way we go about life. So if I'm going to live by faith, that's going to require, on my part anyway, a learning curve and some adjustments. Now, the idea of living by faith comes from Scripture. God is the one who has put that thought out there that we can live by this thing called faith. And there's three different times that he says live by faith within the New Testament. The phrase or term by faith appears numerous times, but I want to read you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to look at verse 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, those are the two different ends of the spectrum, just like by faith or by Bob, or by faith or by sight. Before I got born again, before I became a Christian, I walked only by sight. I had no other choice. That was the only option available to me. But now, I do have a choice. I can continue to walk by me, I can continue to walk by Bob, or I can learn some of God's ways and begin to walk by faith. Now, even though I now have had this ability to walk by faith for over 50 years, I have found that there are still areas of my life where I continue to walk by sight or by me. And the results have not been spectacular. Maybe you can identify with that. To walk by faith, if that's what we're going to do, we have to start by understanding what this word faith means. What is God talking about when he says by faith? Because we have this English word faith all over the planet. It's very common just in English speech, and it's all over the Christian world. But yet, for most people, it's a little vague. What does God mean? What is God talking about when he requests of us to live by faith? If we don't settle this, then we have no hope of doing anything by faith. And 
there's a lot of confusion about what it means to do something by faith. Now, in modern English usage, the word faith is used in two different ways. And if you looked it up in a dictionary, you would find many dictionaries will give you what they call a religious definition of faith, and they would give you what they call a non-religious or a secular definition of faith. And usually, the religious definition of faith goes something like this. Faith is believing something without proof. Ever hear of a definition, you know, faith used in a similar way to that? Most of us have. But then there's another definition of faith, and that is what they call the secular view of faith. And the secular definition of faith means to have complete trust or confidence in someone or something, to have complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's really the biblical definition of faith. I don't know, you know, people can use things in a religious way all they like, but I'm interested in the biblical way God uses faith. And this word faith in the Bible means to have complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, in your Bibles, when you read it, you'll see two words that I want to point out to you. You'll see the word faith, and you'll see the word believe. They don't look anything like one another in English. However, in the original language of the New Testament, which was Greek, they mean the exact same thing. One is a noun, one is a verb, but they come from the same root, which you don't see that in English, so that's why I'm telling it to you. So faith and believe both mean the exact same thing, and what they mean is to have complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now for us, the someone we have complete confidence in is God, and the something that we have complete confidence in is his word. Now, I want to give you a definition of this. Faith is being so confident in God that you change how you live because of what you believe. That's the essence of what God is talking about. You see, faith is not an opinion that you have. Faith is not simply knowledge that you have obtained. Faith is a confidence. It is when you are so confident in something that you are willing to adjust your life because of it. If you're not willing to change direction because of what you claim to believe, then you might have an opinion about the Bible, but you don't have faith. Faith always results in a change. Faith always results in making an adjustment. So if we're going to have faith in God, it means we trust him. It means we have confidence in him. And how's that done? How do you have confidence in God who is invisible? Well, what you really have confidence in is what he has said. And that's the same with people. If you say that you believe Bob, well, what does that mean? Well, you believe Bob. It means you believe something that Bob has told you. So if you're going to have faith in God, that means that you believe something God has said. You have accepted it as true, but not only have you accepted it as true, that's just the opinion part. You've accepted it as true, and you have so internalized it that you've been willing to change how you live because of what you now believe. Now, how do you get faith? A lot of people talk about this. I, I, I wish I had more faith, like it's hiding somewhere. Faith isn't hiding somewhere. Faith is something that comes from within us when we hear something from God. Faith, more than anything else, starts with a decision you make about something God has said. That's what it says in Romans 10, 17. It says, so then faith comes not by effort. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. because we're talking about biblical faith. Biblical faith comes from first hearing something that God has said. Faith is a response. Faith is not the initiator. Faith is a response. God is the one who is the initiator. I thought Steve brought that up in our worship time beautifully when he talked about God as the creator spoke first light into existence. God is always the first one who moves. Faith is not coming up with your own ideas and then asking God to bless them. 
That's not faith. Now, I have no problem coming up with our own ideas. But once you've come up with an idea, run it by God. Okay, if he gives you the thumbs up, then you can pursue it, and then you're pursuing it by faith. Once God weighs in, it can be by faith. So faith, where does faith start? It starts with God. It starts with God saying something. It starts with God making a promise. And our chief source of what God has to say is the Bible. And right after the Bible is God speaking to you directly. Because every Christian man and woman has the Spirit of God within them, which means God can talk to you. I know for many people that's kind of an unusual concept, but God can communicate to you. He can put things on your heart. He could speak audibly to you if he chose to, but he can introduce ideas into your heart and soul so that you can then make adjustments because of God's good ideas. And making those adjustments is what the Bible calls faith. To live by faith means that we trust, we rely upon, we have confidence in something that God has said to the place that we're willing to adjust. So the first step in faith, if you want to, how do I get faith? How do I build faith? Well, the first step is to hear what God says. Then you have to make a decision, just like anything else. Whenever you see any bit of information, you make a decision about it. Maybe as you were driving here this morning, you saw a sign planted at a corner by the side of the road. It said, make $5,000 a month from home, part-time, in your pajamas. Call 1-800-GET-CASH or something. So that's information, right? So you got this information. What are you going to do with that information? My guess is you did not slam on the brakes to write down the phone number, okay? But you got information. You made a decision to keep driving past it. God's word, whether it's written in the scriptures or whether it's directly given to you, is information. But it is information from a very reliable source. It's information that we should pay attention to. So first we get God's information, from his word, then we make a decision to accept his information as true. Most Christians get to that place. Oh yeah, the Bible's true. Christians don't ordinarily say the Bible's a lie. I mean, I suppose some somewhere have, but ordinarily that's not what Christians say. So we hear God's word, we have God's word, we say it's true, but then we stop. That's not faith. That's not faith. That's an opinion. What we need to do is to trust that information and act upon the Word of God. And I want to show you a record that illustrates this. It's a record about a healing. Jesus Christ, he healed lots of people. This is a healing in Mark chapter 3 where he healed a man with a paralyzed hand. It's one of my favorite records of healing in Scripture because it says a lot about Jesus. It says a lot about faith and how simple it is. In Mark 3 verse 1 it says, And he, Jesus, entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered or a paralyzed hand. And they, now if the, if the Bible had a soundtrack, then when I just read, and they, that's when the ominous music rises up, okay? They, in this verse, is talking about the Pharisees who were there to criticize Jesus, not to learn from him. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Isn't that just like religion? Religion doesn't give any, doesn't give a, like I want to be careful what I say. Religion doesn't care. Religion doesn't care about the person. Religion cares about how it looks. Is he going to do it on the right day of the week? Hey, it's the Sabbath. They shouldn't be healed on the Sabbath. Who said that? Religion said that. God never said that. And Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Now, you, now we've all lived long enough. We can read body language, right? You can see the Pharisees sitting there stroking their beards. You can tell, okay, this group over here, they don't like this guy so much. And if I'm going to walk over and stand next to this guy, Jesus, they're going to not like me so much either. But you know what? This man was more interested in deliverance and what God had in store for him than he cared about the criticism of the leaders of his nation. 
And so Jesus tells the guy, come here. So he, the guy comes and stands with him. And then Jesus turns to those people who were criticizing him for healing on the wrong day of the week. And he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Usually when Jesus asked the question, it exposed hypocrisy. It exposed the darkness in a man or a woman's heart. And they just kept silent. And it says he looked round about them with anger. Oh, but I thought if you were a Christian, you never got angry. Well, who was more Christian than Jesus Christ? Okay? And he got angry. But he doesn't get angry about the things you and I get angry about. He doesn't get angry because somebody cut him off on Ogden Avenue or took the parking space at the grocery store. Jesus Christ got angry when somebody was standing in God's way when, they were, when God wanted to heal somebody. That's what angered Jesus. And then he said to the man, he didn't let his anger rule him. He recognized these people are trying to stop God, but he wasn't going to let that happen. The response of his anger was not a temper tantrum. The response of his anger was to heal somebody, to carry out God's will. And he said to the man, here's where we're going to get to faith. I know you're wondering, Bob, when are you going to start talking about faith? Nice stuff, but faith? He said to the man, stretch out your hand. This man's hand was paralyzed. This guy, everybody in the synagogue knew this guy. Synagogues were local gathering places. They all knew that his hand was paralyzed. Jesus says, stretch forth your hand. This man knows by long experience that stretching forth his hand is impossible. But you know what he does with that information? Jesus gave him, what, what did he give him? Four words in English. Stretch out your hand. Four words. Four words, powerful words, if they're true. Jesus gave this man information, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. This man was healed by faith. Because remember, that is our theme for the year, by faith. What did this man do by faith? What is by faith in this record? He heard a promise from God. And instead of explaining to Jesus why he couldn't stretch forth his hand, he endeavored to do what he knew previously to be impossible. He took action on the word of the Lord. He took action on something that he heard. You see, you need a word from God. And here he had a word from the Lord. He had a word from God. Stretch out your hand. So now he knows from God's perspective, this is possible. And he tried it and he was healed. So you can't decide. You can't decide to walk on water. Okay. If God tells you to walk on water, go right ahead. But you can't decide to walk on water on your own. That's by Bob. That's by me. That's not by faith. For it to be by faith, it's got to be something that God has first spoken, whether in his written word or directly to you. In everyday life, when you carry out something God has told you, that is living by faith. It doesn't matter if God told you on the pages of Scripture or directly through his Spirit. In fact, we should all expect both. I want to look at a contrast between by faith and by me. It's from Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. The word trust is simply the more common Old Testament word for the New Testament word believe. In fact, if you looked in the dictionary, most of the time the word believe would be defined with the word trust, and the word trust would be defined with the word believe. They're more or less interchangeable. It's just different languages. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Leaning on your own understanding is the opposite of biblical faith. Leaning on your own understanding is by me instead of by faith. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. By me 
is living by my own understanding, living according to my own comfort level, living in respect to my own fears, my own personal preferences, my own convenience. That's all by Bob. That's all by me. None of these common reasons for living life carry with them the blessings of God. And I want to give you some everyday, ordinary examples of what does it mean to live by faith? How can I live by faith as I leave the uh, center this morning? Here's some examples. I pray by faith. What does that mean when I say I pray by faith? Well, it means a couple of things. One, it means I pray because God has declared that he will hear and answer my prayers. So because God has said and given me access to him 24-7, I choose to pray, and I pray by faith. And when I talk to him, I have confidence that he will answer my prayers, not because I'm desperate for an answer, but because he's offered to answer them. Another way that I pray by faith is many times throughout the day, God will bring a a certain person or a certain situation before my mind. So if God were to bring before my mind Ron Flory, I would be praying for Ron. That is praying by faith because God is the one who brought Ron before my mind to pray for him. Another thing in prayer by faith, I, by faith, I pray for those who are in authority within our country. And actually, I pray for those who are in authority in all countries. Even I pray for even those people I disagree with. And when I pray for somebody I disagree with, I don't pray that they will die, okay? That's not, that's not my prayer for people I disagree with. I pray for them for the reason that God says, so that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life and worship and love God. Here's another one. I give by faith. I honor God with my finances, and I do that by faith. What does that mean? Well, it means God has said some things in his word about giving, He says that if you will honor him with the first fruits of your income, he will open the windows of heaven to pour out blessings for you. I believe that verse, therefore I act on it. I choose to tithe to give God 10% of what my increase is. I do that by faith because God has made some awesome promises about that. People give for other reasons, though. Some people give out of obligation. Some people give, but they give their leftovers. They don't give their first fruits to God. Or people give to look good. Sometimes people just want to look good to others. All these are giving, okay? They're all giving. If you give out of obligation, that's still giving. If you give to be seen by men, that's still giving. But it's not giving by faith. Giving by faith is allowing God to direct your steps. Giving by Bob has no promises associated with it. Giving by faith does. Here's another one. I love by faith. I love by faith, which means I love even my enemies. I love people even if they oppose me. Now, anyone can love those who love them. Jesus said even the sinners do that. Anyone can love those who love them. That is not loving by faith. That is loving by me. Now, let me say something. It's good to love those who love you. That's a good thing, okay? Jesus wasn't saying that was a bad thing. But but loving only those who love you is not nearly as powerful and world-changing as loving even your enemies, which is what God directs. So by faith I do that. Not because I feel like it, and obviously not because they're good to me, because they're my enemies, they oppose me. Here's another one that we need to practice, by faith. And you need to do this by faith. By faith, I forgive. By faith, I forgive. God commands me to forgive those who who have wronged me. It's not actually even a suggestion in Scripture, it's a command. I forgive people, not because they've apologized to me. 
I don't forgive people because I feel that they have deserved my forgiveness. I forgive people because God has told me in the face of any offense against my life, of any wrong that I have received, he wants me to offer people's grace. You know what grace is? Grace is something you don't deserve. A lot of times people refuse to forgive others because, well, he doesn't deserve it. Well, duh, that's the whole point of grace. Let me ask you, did you... It, it, did you live your life in such a fashion that you deserved Jesus to hang on a tree for you? No, but he did. He didn't, des- he didn't hang on the tree because I deserved it. He hung on the tree because I needed it. People need our forgiveness. God tells me to offer grace, and God also tells me to let go of resentment. You need to do both. Sometimes people will offer grace, but they hang on to resentment. I had somebody tell me once, well, I don't have anybody to forgive. And I asked them, I said, well, is there anybody, the mention of their name makes you cringe? And well, yeah. Okay, well, then you haven't forgiven that person. You haven't let go of the resentment. Maybe you're not screaming at them any longer, but you haven't let go of it. I bring myself to forgive by faith even when I don't want to. Living by Bob would hold a grudge. You ever hear the term nursing a grudge? You nurse it like it's a oh cute little grudge. Oh, isn't that sweet? I'm gonna nurse this grudge. And that's what people do. They nurse it. They think about the wrong that they've received. And you know what it does? It changes them. It changes them. It ruins them. It doesn't have to be that way. If you forgive by faith, you're not ruined. You're liberated. Forgiveness liberates people. I know, I'm getting a little off topic here. You you know when I'm off topic when I stop looking at my notes? You know, how long is he going to talk this morning? I don't know. He hasn't looked at his notes in like 10 minutes. (laughs) Okay. So living by faith is obeying God's command to forgive with the full confidence that forgiveness is a better way than resentment. And the reason I know it's better is because God says so. Now, faith in Scripture is tied to the word obedience or to the idea of obeying. We don't like the word obey very much in our culture. We don't like the word obedience. But obedience is central to living by faith. And I want to show you a little bit more about it. Here it says, look at Romans 1.5. Do we have that one? I think we might. Oh, we do. Well, I'm going to read it anyway. It says, through whom? Through Christ, we have received grace. Again, that something we don't deserve. And apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. The obedience of faith. When you believe God, you always carry out what he says. You cannot have faith without obedience. If you don't adjust your life, you don't have faith. You just have a good talk. Now, we don't, as I said, most people today, we don't like the word obedience. And the reason we don't like it is because we view obedience as doing something against our own will by force. That's what most people think of when obedience, that I have to do something against my will because of force. Rather than look at obedience as doing something against your will, why not look at obedience as doing something in light and in line with God's will? When you look at it that way, I am going to do something in light of God's will. That takes the emphasis off of me, because I don't want to live by me, and it puts the emphasis on God, who is the starting point of something by faith. By the way, the word translated obedience in the New Testament anyway, simply means to give a favorable hearing to something. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give a favorable hearing to things that God says. And then to make a decision about that information, to decide, yeah, you know, I think that what God says is right. I think that's true. And then adjust your life because of it. So 
knowing what faith is, when, it, when God says do it by faith, what he means is to carry out, obey, act on, adjust your life to something that he has said. And knowing that that's what God means by faith is going to help you understand one of the great chapters in the Bible. It's Hebrews chapter 11. People call this the great chapter on faith. Some people call it the chapter on the heroes of faith. And common to all the people in Hebrews chapter 11 is that they heard something from God and adjusted their life based on what they heard. And, you know, God doesn't hold a gun to your head, by the way. So you don't have to adjust yourself to God's will. You don't have to do that. It's just a good idea. Because his, whose who's opinion do you want? You know, you know Ryan uh, Powers here. Ryan Powers works in construction. He's a handyman. If you need your sink faucet replaced, who would you rather listen to? Ryan Powers, who's done hundreds of sink faucets, or Bob Carden, who's done none. But I looked at a YouTube video, okay? So whose opinion would be better about replacing faucets? Well, Ryan's, of course. How about life? Do you want Bob's opinion about life or even your own opinion about life? Or how about the opinion of the person who invented life? So... Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 1. This is sort of a definition of faith, by the way. It says, now faith is. Oh, what is faith? Well, now faith is. What is faith? It is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The reason that you can be sure and that you can be certain is because God has said something. And we trust that what God says is true. This is not, faith is not done without proof. You know, it's not without proof. It is based on a promise. Biblical faith is always based on something that God has said. That's something tangible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's see, this ties in beautifully with what Steve shared this morning. It says in verse 2 of Hebrews 11, this is what the ancients were commended for. I, I get a kick when I read that. This was written in about 60 AD. And in, I consider people who lived in 60 AD ancients. Okay? But here, this person in 60 AD is obviously talking about people who were as far removed from him as he is from me. So he calls them the ancients. They were commended for what? For faith. He says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We understand that by faith. What does that mean? It means the verse that Steve read for us during worship, that God created the heavens and the earth, that God spoke light into being. We believe that that's what occurred because God has said that that is what occurred. Verse 4 is an interesting one. How many of you have heard the story of Cain and Abel? Most people have heard that story of Cain and Abel. Two sons of Adam, one, both of whom offered sacrifices to God. One gave a sacrifice of a lamb. One gave a sacrifice of the produce of the ground. The sacrifice of the lamb was accepted. The sacrifice of the produce was not accepted. You ever wonder what was going on there? Does God not like vegetables? I have friends who don't like vegetables very much. Is God like that? He only likes meat? No. We're going to see what this was in a, a moment here. It says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. Because it says by faith, you know what that means? It means God told him what kind of offering he should bring. Because if God hadn't told him, he might have still brought a lamb, but it wouldn't have been by faith. It would have been by Abel. So the reason that Abel's sacrifice was acceptable was because God told both Cain and Abel what type of sacrifice to bring. Abel complied with that and did what God had requested. Cain had a better idea. So Abel is by faith, Cain is by Cain. And whose was accepted? Abel's was. By faith, Abel brought 
a, got a better offering than Cain did. The only th- there's nothing intrinsically better f- than from vegetables to meat. What made it better was it was by faith. It was something God had said. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. By faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. His faith is an example to us even to this day. Now, one of my favorite people in Hebrews 11 is in verse 8. It's Abraham. This is by faith on a level that, you know, I'll be honest, I don't see in my own life very often. So this is the reason that Abraham is called the father of believing and not Bob, okay? But let's just read Abraham. It's a remarkable record. By faith, Abraham. So if it was by faith, it means God told him something, right? So by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Think about that. God did not give him an address. God just said, Abraham, get up, pack your belongings, and start to move. Didn't even told him where to go. How's that for faith? Abraham obeyed without the need to understand everything. One of the obstacles to living by faith today for most Christians is they want to understand everything. I want everything spelled out six ways from Sunday. Then, God, I'll be happy to do what you say. That's what people want. The greatest heroes of faith are people who would take God at his word even if God didn't explain everything up front. At times, we demand from God understanding. But what God asks for is faith. Jesus said in his prayer, give us this day our daily bread, okay? Most people would prefer to alter that. Our heavenly father, give us this day all the bread I'm going to need for the rest of my life because then I'll be comfortable. But that's not what Jesus said. Give us this day our daily bread so that I can rely on him day by day. Moses is another great one on faith. In verse 27 of Hebrews, it says, By faith, Moses left Egypt, which meant God told him to leave Egypt. It wasn't his idea to go lead the children of Israel. It wasn't his ideas. Not fearing the wrath of the king, even when the king was pursuing him with his armies. He endured as seeing him who is unseen. How's that? As if he's, you can't see the invisible God. But Moses acted on those words from God just as surely as if God was visible to him. Because what he knew of God was what he spoke. To live by faith means that we accept what God says is true to be of greater value than what the world says. And we believe that what God says is also more important. More important than what the world says. More important than what Bob says. Because it's by faith, not by me. And faith is easy. Believing is easy. We do it all the time. Right now, before I uttered a word of my teaching, you were living your life by faith. The problem was, not all of your faith was something that God had said. See, believing what people say is living by faith, right? It's just not living by faith in God. And that's the context in the Bible. Believing what people say doesn't always work out. Believing what God says does. See, it's not a question of do you have faith. It's not a question of do you live by faith. Of course you do. It's just that not all of our faith is in something that God has said. The people in Hebrews, they were no different than you or me. People are people. doesn't matter if they lived yesterday or 5,000 years ago. These people heard from God. They heard something from God. They adjusted their lives. We've heard things from God, just like they did. They adjusted their lives, so can we. Adjusting your life to something God has said is living by faith. It's the most exciting ride you're ever going to take. And I want us to do that together this year. You know, when God put impressed upon Garrett that this should be our theme, if he just wanted it the theme for Garrett, that it wouldn't have gone any further. That would have been fine. God just said, Garrett, I want you to live by faith this year. He would have said, okay. 
But then God moved him to share it with us so that we could be on a journey together of adjusting our lives to God. What has God spoken to you lately? You might say, well, I don't think God does speak to me. Oh, yeah, he does. Open the Bible. But even more than that, you have the Spirit of God within you. You, I am sure, you have had ideas cross your mind that were just too good to have come out of your own head. Okay? God is always introducing ideas and thoughts into our minds and our hearts. Follow them. You know, I have just learned that especially, it's like, say, I, here's another thing. I teach by faith. doesn't mean I don't teach just because I know how to read the scriptures. I look at the scriptures and I, and I allow God to work within me to direct me. And sometimes he'll just give me something to say, like I hadn't thought about that at all. But I write it down because I want to do things by faith. And if God, if you're at work and you're pondering a problem at work and all of a sudden you get an insight Why not think, you know, this might just be something God has said. I ought to do something about that. Have you embraced what God is saying to you? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we step back. We have a lot of reasons for not embracing God. Has God moved you to change, but you've allowed fear to paralyze you? As you read God's word, as you sit with God in prayer and listen, allow God to direct your steps. Allow God to show you what your day can be about. And then go and live your life by faith. Let's love by faith. Let's pray by faith. Let's give by faith. Let's work by faith. And let's forgive by faith. In fact, why not just do everything by faith? Consult God. Allow him to work within you and then carry it out because his ideas are best. Let me tell you something about faith. I want to, I want to tell you how faith is spelled. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. When God tells you something, like he told Abraham, just get up and move. Well, Packing up everything you own and leaving, that's, that has a certain risk involved with it. The point is, was it Abraham's idea or did Abraham believe it to be God's idea? Abraham recognized it as God. So that's what he did. Did he take a risk? Yeah, he did. Did that man with the withered hand take a risk? Sure he did. He took a twofold risk. One, he could just look stupid if he didn't get healed. And two, he has all these Pharisees out there giving him dirty looks. Faith takes risks. But you know what? That man took the risk and his arm was healed. He could have played it safe. I've played it safe plenty of times. He could have played it safe. He was already accustomed to living with a paralyzed arm. He could have played it safe and died with a withered hand. Or he could have taken a risk on a word of the Lord and seeing his healing. Living by faith carries great blessings involved. You see, I don't want to miss anything that God has planned for my life. I have already missed too much, let me tell you. I've just already missed too much. Living by faith, listen to this, living by faith opens the door to let our dreams come true. Not the by me dreams, but the life that God has dreamed for you before the foundation of the world. By faith opens the door for that. Your life can be significantly different. And by different, I mean better, more exciting, more fulfilling than ever before if we choose to live by faith. So let's pray together. Father God, thanks for this time and your word. Thank you, God, that you're, you speak. You're not mute. Thank you, God, that you open your mouth, God, and thank you for ears, ears to hear. And I pray, Father, that we can, each and every one of us, recognize whatever it is that you are working within us today. 
What are you directing each of us to do in our lives? Something small, something big, something different. God, I ask that you help us recognize your voice and then you give us the courage to follow it, Father. And I pray that this year of living by faith and every year after it of living by faith can be world-changing. And I pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, God bless you. You're wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob. I was taking notes. I encourage you guys to uh, watch that again because that was powerful. So, so powerful. You know, the, God, the things with God are just are so incredibly simple. As Bob was saying, just adjust. One thing I just kept writing down, and I just, just adjust your life, you know. It's, it's rather simple. As complex as God is, and Steve shed some light on that earlier this morning, how complex God is and how powerful he is. It's like all he wants us to do is, is just trust in him. And that's pretty simple. He said that the children, Jesus said that the children among us, it's to them that belong the kingdom of heaven. Think about how impressionable kids are. It doesn't take too much for a child to just say, okay, all right, okay. But you got you to gotta hear it. You got to hear the word of truth. You got to hear power. This book right here, in fact, I was talking with, Daniel, Daniel Nig, he, he heads up our production team. You guys don't see him behind uh, the screen here, but he does a great work for this house. And we, we were talking this morning when we came in, and, and we were just talking about sharing with me some things that he's been reading and just, just enjoying in God's Word. And he says, you know, when I pick up that Bible, when I hold it in my hands, it's like I'm holding power. Think about that. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to get some of this power to hold in your hands, to just this, this tangible book. But it's up to you to actually unlock that power. It's up to you to actually, like Bob said, believe what is in there and adjust your life. A lot of us have been reading Scripture for a long time. And the beautiful thing with God is it, it, there's constant movement as you follow Jesus Christ. There's constant development. There's constant growth. And that means that there's constant adjustments that need to be made in your life. Maybe it's a, a thought process or whatever it is, but he wants you to continue to adjust to what he has spoken to be true. You've got power right here. Something Bob hit on just a minute ago was, was to also give by faith, to live by faith. Living by faith is, is, is literally everything. It encompasses everything. I think sometimes we make excuses for ways that are a little bit too uncomfortable, and, and we say, well, you know, I, I, I give in this area instead, or I, I, I do that instead, and the finances, I'll, I'll hold on to that. And God's saying, you know, I want you to trust me with that too. You know, as he's spoken in his word, he wants us to give of the first fruits. David said this, he said that, I, I don't want to give anything back to God that's not going to cost me something. That's what David said. And so I encourage you to step out in faith. I have not met one person that has stepped out in faith that has continually sown into the kingdom financially in the movement of God's word that has been stuck in between a rock and a hard place where God has not delivered them. You trust God with your finances, I guarantee you that he is going to come through and show you ways that he can deliver in greater ways that you could ever, ever imagine. So we're going to have a time to allow you to experience what it looks like to trust God even with your finances. There's baskets around the room that you can give into, and this is by faith. Trust God. Say, God, I'm going to give back to you. And if you guys are watching online, there's ways to give. We're going to throw up a slide right after this. But I want to pray and just ask God to just do what he has said that he's going to do, which is bless you back. So, Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for this house, this home that we get to just worship you and to grow to be more like your son. Father, we want to be people that live by faith. And so, Father, it is such a joy and a pleasure to live that uncomfortable life, 
to step out and to adjust our lives to see your power come to pass. So God, I thank you for those that are um, giving and trusting you right now in a greater way that perhaps they've, they've ever trusted you before regarding their finances. Father, I thank you for being one who is, is a man of your word. And I thank you, Father, for blessing them back in greater ways that they could ever imagine. Father, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I was praying, I was reminded um, our daughter, Lily, an eight-year-old girl, last week, she came home and she t- said, yeah, I put $20 into the basket. And, and her papa gave her $20 right back. And he said, essentially, it's, it's a law of the kingdom of heaven. When you give, it will be added back unto you. And, uh, and I just know a lot of times God blesses us back instantly like that. Sometimes it's just a matter of trusting the process and watching him go to work in our lives over a course of time. But nonetheless, he will bless you. He loves you. Let's have a great week following Christ Jesus. Continue to declare those truths and the power that you hold in your hand. I love you guys. See you guys next week. You're the